Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to help us County. Um, I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you. Um, this is the Environmental Considerations Panel. Um, uh, you know, briefly about my role, uh, counties are making decisions about how to go about developing uh, their regulatory programs for cannabis and, and where, you know, a lot of the responsibility uh, for that will lie. Um, I am aware of uh, different examples of that in different counties. In some counties, the Ag Commissioner's Office may be more involved. Some counties, it may be a planning issue. Humble, firstly, address this as planning and land use. Um, it will become the responsibility of my agency, the Ag Commissioner's Office, to inspect cannabis cultivation sites. Cannabis is a, is a, is a plant, it's cultivated in the soil. Um, it seems appropriate that my office, given the long, uh, strong relationships we have with the other industry groups, would be responsible for, for doing these inspections. It kind of really already fits with the skill sets that we have, the licenses that we have, and, and the, um, the, the ability that we have to work well with uh, the agricultural industry. Um, our Williamson Act Committee, I think I would mention that to you because it may be important to you in your counties that our Williamson Act Committee took up the idea of whether or not cannabis was a compatible use under our guidelines. And what our committee decided was that yes, cannabis was a compatible use under our Williamson Act guidelines. But what they did is they changed the rules around it to reflect that a majority of the land area still needed to be used for the cultivation of the agricultural commodity. And what that means is that you cannot just have a 2,000 square foot greenhouse on your agricultural preserve and use that to meet the income requirements for your uh, the program rules around the Williamson Act compliance. So it is compatible use, but you can only use the majority of the land area for the production of that ag commodity. Um, it was mentioned earlier how we had decided to do a track and trace. One of the things that was not addressed in the county's uh, land use ordinance was the branding. Humboldt County, uh, good or bad, it has a reputation in the world of cannabis and cannabis users for high quality product. Industry was very, very vocal about saying that there's an opportunity for here here for us if you can help us. Track and Trace became a logical vehicle for us to be able to provide uh, that branding opportunity. So not only did we have a branded stamp that showed that the product was a genuine Humboldt County product, um, but you could also check the identity of that product and verify it that it was uh, produced by a certain producer. You could link to test results. Um, it was a genuine Humboldt County product. And I grabbed one of the samples from the back, and I don't know if you can see it. You can get a better look in the back, but it has this stamp up in the upper uh, corner. It has the County of Humboldt. There is a QR code on that. You can use that code to identify that this is a genuine product. There were, during the, the time of our pilot, and, and we were fortunate in that, the uh, vendor that we worked with, SIGPA, was interested in competing for the statewide contract. And so they were willing to do a pilot with the county for no cost. The cost to the county for the program was for staff time. And there was some considerable staff time, but it allowed us the opportunity to learn to apply track and trace methodologies. It allows us to work with a subset of the industry to uh, allow those that we work with to communicate with their peers to say, the Ag Department wants to work with you, they're compliance oriented, and it was also then the opportunity for us to begin reaching out to this cannabis industry about the other areas applicable to the Ag community that we are responsible for enforcing. Weights and measures, and of course pesticide requirements. So we've been communicating and working with the cannabis industry on pesticide compliance and on weighing and measuring requirements that we also are responsible for. The other thing we did is we advocated for a batch and lot methodology approach. Batch and lot is, uh, as opposed to some other uh, ways of tracking and tracing, is an approach that's um, supported by industry. Um, 
They use other systems in other states. Batch and lock had not been tried. And so our pilot was based around a batch and lock approach to track and trace. So those were the reasons that we did that. Ultimately, we felt like it was very successful. There were more than 30,000 stamps that were applied to uh, 3,000 uh, pounds of Humboldt County uh, medical cannabis. And so we are waiting for our state partners to make a decision about track and trace. And then we will be moving with our own program. Uh, the state has been uh, very upfront with us and clear that they do not feel like initially the state program will be able to meet the needs of local jurisdiction. And so we feel it's important that we can, through our own track and trace program, demonstrate that any of the cannabis that's produced under the county's program meet the federal guidelines or those guidelines as they exist currently, which are the full amendment guidelines. Uh, that's very important to us. And so for some period of time, we feel like it's important for us to have a local program. Better? Okay, sorry about that. Thanks for the, uh, the heads up. So, um, the panel is really about, I'm glad to answer any questions you might have. The panel uh, is about environmental issues. And so, we have uh, Lindsay Raines who joined the Cal Cannabis uh, program last year. She had worked for CDFA Plant Health Division for many years in various capacities before then. She will talk about the state and where they are with their regulations. Uh, my office will be working with the state to do enforcement for the state regulations for local cannabis cultivators, as well as doing enforcement of our local requirements. We also have Scott Bauer here. He has been uh, very busy with the watershed enforcement team. Uh, he's been with Fish and Wildlife in, in a lot of various capacities, uh, timber harvest plan review, stream bed alteration agreement permitting, coho salmon recovery a lot of different areas where he's worked on, but he has been on many panels and has become uh, a really an expert about the environmental issues and the problems around uh, unregulated cannabis cultivation. So Scott is here, very lucky to hear from him. And then we have Dan Schultz, the other agency who is in the forefront of dealing with the issues, the negative ones, the environmental issues, the damage that's occurring from the unregulated cultivation of this county. Uh, Dan is a senior environmental scientist with State Water Resources Control Board uh, in the Division of Water Rights. Uh, he's worked with the division since 2010 and currently serves as the Chief of the Cannabis Interim Flow Unit. So, all of these folks are going to be able to give you that other part of the picture, which is the environmental damage and what the state agencies are doing to address that. And Lindsay will talk about the state program and how uh, we are going to be out there doing those inspections and, and beginning to regulate this industry and address a lot of the negative things that we've seen. So uh, thank you all. Uh, Lindsay, I believe you're using the PowerPoint. You're going to go first. Good afternoon. Thank you for having us here. I'm with CDFA, the Cal Campus Cultivation Licensing Program. I'm going to go over the roles of the various state agencies that are participating in this uh, new regulated framework, what uh, we have in our state cultivation licensing regulations, some per environmental protection measures that we've proposed, and then our technology projects, which include a licensing system and the track and trace system that Jeff spoke about. So the basics, uh, just in case you're not aware, you guys are a pretty informed group, but there was the Medical Act in 2015, uh, then there was the Adult Use of Marijuana Act that was voted in uh, in 2016. And now we have Malcursa. Um, and my slide is already out of date because when I sent it to Betsy on Monday, the governor had not signed Malcursa yet, um, but it is now signed and it was to align the two laws. So now we have one set of guiding statutes for us, which in no way is good, but it does have some significant changes that we need to analyze um, how they will impact our program. And then we have regulations. We released our medical ones. We are continuing to develop and fine tune the text of those regulations um, as the year goes on. So the licensing authorities, there's three of us at the state level. There's the Bureau of Medical Cannabis Regulation, but actually their name just changed with the signing of Malcursa. So the slide is out of date too. There's us, the Cal Cannabis Cultivation Licensing Program within CDFA. We license cultivators, commercial cultivators. 
And then there's the Office of Manufactured Cannabis Safety within the Department of Public Health. They're going to license manufacturers. Who does what? So we, we're the cultivators, manufacturers are under public health, and then Bureau has distribution, transportation is gone now with Mount Cursa, um, testing and dispensaries or retail. This is very much a collaborative effort, as you're, if you're not aware already, we've got the State Water Board, um, Department of Pesticide Regulation, which we work with pretty regularly, as do the Ag Commissioners. Um, Department of Fish and Wildlife is involved. Department of Justice, all of our applicants are going to have to have a background check. Cal OSHA is going to be involved. Once you're a licensed business in California, you're subject to worker safety laws. Cities and counties, so not only are counties in this field, there's also 458 cities that can have different ordinances. So we're in the process of reviewing all of those local ordinances as they change. There's a treasurer's office. We're constantly having to look into funding and changing our funds as we plan for this ever-changing situation. BOE is involved. They'll be collecting taxes. The governor's office is involved. They have regular oversight meetings on everything we do. And then for our technology projects, we have the Department of Technology, which oversees um, us procuring those. And there's a very formal process the state has to go through for procuring the systems. And since they're so expensive, we have to go, everything has to be double checked. So that's why it's taken us so long to get our track and trace vendor on board. These are our license types. Just in case you're not aware of them, we're going to be issuing outdoor, indoor, and mixed light license types. We have a specialty cottage, which is the smallest all the way up through large. The medium license types, we are required to limit statewide. We proposed in our regulations limiting them to one per person. Um, that's subject to change. Um, their regulations are not final. The large license type, we won't be issuing until 2023, and they're pretty large, but I don't think any counties have that size come up yet. And then the nursery license, there's no canopy size. Uh, we haven't determined whether or not there would be size limits on a nursery. So in our proposed medical regulations, we had definitions, an application section, which included fees and processing, licensing requirements, which also included a separate licensing fee from our application fee, and various requirements that each licensee would have to comply with. We had site-specific requirements for indoor, outdoor, and mixed light license types, and then we also had a pretty good section on records and track and trace inspections and enforcement so the industry could see what that might look like in 2018. So some of our application requirements that are environmentally protective, every applicant will have to provide their water source or water sources. We understand there's multiple. And that information we'd be sharing with the water board so they could do inspections and verify that those water sources were legitimate. Every applicant will have to provide us with evidence um, of enrollment with the regional water board program. And then once there is a statewide one, they'd be providing us evidence of that. And we'd also need evidence of compliance with Department of Fish and Wildlife's Lake and Stream Bed Alteration Agreement, whether or not they need one. And for indoor uh, applicants, we are requiring their power source. So then generally, license requirements that are environmentally protective, they will be required to comply with the Water Board's principles and guidelines, which Dan's going to go over in a moment. They would have to comply with Department of Pesticide Regulations guidance and laws. And so DPR has actually provided a pretty short list of pesticides, active ingredients that are not illegal for use on cannabis, and rodenticides, which have been an issue up north here quite a bit, are not going to be allowed at cultivation sites. And the Ag Commissioners enforce DPR's rules and guidance. We have proposed a ban on generators. Uh, we received a lot of comments about that, and we'll be taking a good look at how to improve that part of the regulation. We've also proposed a 42% renewable ener energy source for indoor license types. We also received quite a few comments on that, and we'll be taking a good look at that. So timelines, we released our draft medical regulations in April, we had a 45 day public comment period. We got about 300 comments, but they were very detailed, which was great. I think the industry has been very helpful in trying to provide us with good feedback that can help us improve our regulations rather than just saying that's not gonna work which is generally what you get in regulation. So we're in the process of considering all those comments right now, and then we'll go back and look and see how we can improve. We had hoped to release a draft, an updated draft in late summer, but with the new Mount Cursa, that may be delayed a little bit. 
So this was the process we were going to use for implementing our adult use uh, regulations, but now this is how we're going to implement our Mount Cursa regulations. We're going to use the emergency rulemaking process, which is probably going to be a little bit confusing for industry. It's kind of backwards. You don't get a public comment period up front. We'll implement the regulations in late fall, and they won't be effective until January 1, 18. And then immediately following emergency rulemaking, we would be going through the normal process. So after they're effective, then people get to start making comments on them. It's a little bit backwards, and hopefully we can message that to the industry in a way that's not, and local stakeholders, that's not terribly confusing. We released our draft PEIR a couple weeks ago. We're in the public comment period for that now. We started it with just the Medical Act in mind, and then we had to amend our contract with our consultants to add adult use, but we are on track to have it complete by 2018. So we analyzed several required factors that you need to for CEQA. The comment period closes July 31st. We have four public meetings scheduled coming up in July, one in Beaverville, one in Quincy, one in Monterey, and one in San Diego. So if you guys, are any, if any of those are in your areas, I recommend going. There's details on our website about where those meetings are. So our two technology projects, we have an online licensing system that will be ready by 2018 to accept applications. We hope people will use it. Uh, it should help us with the incomplete application problem. And then our track and trace system, uh, which will also be up and running by 2018. It will be one system used by all three licensing authorities and all licensees will have to input into the state system. And it will track cannabis from seed to sale. So every plant has to be tagged under law, even Mount Cursa. And the vendor that we choose will dictate what that tag looks like. There's always a lot to consider. The dual licensing, a lot of the law was written so that there'd be local control, and we respect that and understand that. Alignment is, we can remove that from the slide now because Macursa has been aligned with AMA to make Maucursa. The federal status is always an unknown, and the impacts that it may have to our program is something that we are aware of, but we are moving forward. But things like organic, our, that's a federal word, and people want an organic cannabis program, and that just can't happen until it's federally legal. We don't know the number of licensees. It's nice to start hearing some of the numbers coming out of the counties um, so we can start to plan for January 118, which really isn't very far away. Enforcement's a big deal. We've heard it throughout the day-to-day -day that people are worried about the Ill illegal growers continuing to have a place in the market um, once people start getting licensed. and so. The state agencies have started thinking about how we will be part of enforcement and have a complaint-driven process that we can funnel those to law, the correct law enforcement agency. And then we always try to look for the balance of finding how we're gonna make this work when the barriers to entry are already significantly high. We've tried to find a way to have our program be accessible to anybody who wants to be a part of it while still maintaining all the environmental protection measures that need to occur. If you have questions, you can visit our website. Um, our email, we also have a public email address that we answer right away. We also have a phone. We have staff answering questions. Give us a call, we're there. If you're not already on our listserv, I highly recommend getting on that, and you can do that through our website, but that's where we announce information. And that's it. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, next, we have uh, Dan Schultz with the State Water Resources Control Board. He also has a PowerPoint. So, my name is Dan Schultz. I'm on the State Water Board, uh, Division of Water Rights, and um, we are developing a policy for water quality control that will include principles and guidelines, or easier said, requirements for cannabis cultivation statewide. Is that you? Yep. So a little quick background, um, the legislation requires the State Water Board to ensure that the cumulative and individual effects of cannabis cultivation do not negatively impact the flows needed for fish spawning, migration, rearing, and the natural flow variability, and also to protect aquatic resources, um, including riparian habitat, aquatic habitat, 
and um, wetlands from the negative impacts cans cultivation. In addition, these requirements uh, may extend to groundwater requirements as well, as, a, as well as uh, requirements for diversions from springs. So the principles and guidelines or the requirements will go in three primary programs. Uh, one is the uh, a waste discharge regulatory program, uh, which is under development right now in concurrence with the uh, principles and guidelines. And the WDR program will eventually be a statewide program that will replace Region 1's and Region 5's existing programs. Uh, we're also developing a small irrigation and use registration program. And the principles and guidelines will also be incorporated into uh, CDFA's licensing program. So there's two main components with the principles and guidelines. There's flow requirements, and then there's what we're generally considering non-flow requirements or requirement discharge related requirements. So the flow requirements, there's the surface water flow requirements, which include uh, requirements for a dry season forbearance period, and then certain uh, in-stream flow requirements for uh, surface diversions during the wet season. And those will be both narrative and numeric. We also have uh, some groundwater provisions to evaluate the impacts of groundwater, and so there will also be a flow requirement developed during the dry season to, in, to provide information on where groundwater might be having an impact on surface flows. The non-flow requirements include things such as site development and maintenance, diversion and storage of water, and discharge and use of the water. So we divided the state up into 14 regional boundaries. The interim principles and guidelines will apply statewide. And I should mention that there's a two-stage process for this. There's development of interim principles and guidelines and long-term principles and guidelines. Our current approach is doing the interim principles and guidelines statewide, and then we'll start to take a closer look at the, at the individual regions as we move forward where we start to see cannabis cultivation um, having more significant uh, growth or impacts. The, both the interim and the long-term principles and guidelines can be updated as reasonably necessary by the state as well. So as we gather more information on the impacts and different, and different uh, things happening with cannabis cultivation, we can address that as we go. So a little more detail on the um, wet season flow requirements. We have we developed the wet season flow requirements using the Tesman method. This is a uh, desktop approach. We had modeled information of natural or unimpaired flow for um, the majority of stream reaches throughout California that we were using to use this. Um, basically, it allows us to establish a flow requirement at pretty much any location on a stream throughout the state, um, except for there's uh, some nuances with some of the streams that weren't modeled that flow out of the state. So some of the areas in the Klamath region, some of the areas in the in the eastern, uh, east of the Sierras, we, we don't have uh, flow requirements we can fill up there, but for most of the state, we, we have them set. Um, the way we're rolling this forward is we're developing the flow requirements at compliance gauges. So we looked to start with at the um, suite of United States Geologic Service gauges and the Department of Water Resources gauges, or CDEC gauges, California Department of Environmental Exchange. Um, those sets of gauges we developed the flow requirements at, those will be the compliance gauges, and then we're working on developing the um, gauge assignments for different watersheds throughout the state um, to which gauge they will report to. Obviously, there's an issue with this in that we have a lot more watersheds than we do gauges, but this is just how we're starting to move forward. As we move forward, we anticipate that we will be adding additional existing gauges that we weren't able to um, do, a, do a strong QAQC process on in the short timeline. And then also, we, we're including provisions in the requirements where we see areas where there's dense cannabis cultivation to potentially have them install a gauge at that location to make sure that there's not localized impacts. And vice versa, cannabis cultivators would have the opportunity to put in their own gauge if they don't think that the gauge that they're reporting to is reflective of their water use in their watershed. And then the dry season flow requirements. Um, this slide is a little bit out of date. It's uh, right now we're, we're considering the September median flow. 
or I should say the August, September, October median flow, whichever is the lowest. So for the non-flow requirements, um, a lot of this actually comes from legislation, but the different areas that we are, we are addressing from the discharge standpoint are listed here on the slide. Um, this is pretty similar to what you've already seen in Region 1 and Region 5's water quality permits. Uh, there will be some differences as those two permits, or those two uh, orders and were different from each other to start with, so we've kind of combined them in and made additional changes as well to apply it statewide. So the general order in general, um, it's looking at addressing legal cultivation sites. Uh, enforcement will look at illegal cultivation sites. And, you know, it ensures, similar to the other programs, that everybody goes out and gets all their local, state, or other federal permits that they need. And then um, also, in general, uh, requires water right compliance. And the I should add that the right now it's looking at 2,000 square feet of disturbance would be people that need to enroll in the in the WDR. Um, that looks like land disturbance for cultivation related activities versus just cultivated areas. So it's a little different than canopy area um, when you look at the size disturb or commercial cultivators that are less than that, um, there will be a process that we have set up. Um, basically, we're, we're having an online enrollment for both the waste discharge program and the small irrigation program, which I'll get to in a minute. And people self-certify that they fill it out correctly and go through their sizes. If they're commercial less than 2,000 square feet, they'll get a um, conditional exemption. Uh, basically, they still need to um, to meet all the principles and guidelines and everything else, but that's pretty much what they'll be bringing the, the uh, CDFA as their um, evidence of, of enrolling in the program. It also does apply to um, personal medical cultivation if those sites happen to disturb over a thousand square feet. So we're looking at kind of the existing square footage of some of the personal grows. Some of them can be pretty large in some areas. If it's a standard size permitted personal grow of 100 square feet or less and it's not having a lot of extra disturbance, they'll just also be able to go in and, and self-certify that they're not having enough disturbance. Um, neither the, the policy or the WDR will apply to personal use uh, for recreational. So the small irrigation program, um, just in general, we're rolling this out as part of it. I uh, allow people to enroll since we're having all surface water inhibitors move to storage. Um, this gives them a, a, the proper vehicle to move forward efficiently. It incorporates all the requirements that will be in the principles and guidelines. And uh, the small irrigation will be up to 20 acre feet per year. You can couple a domestic use with that as well. Um, I think that's probably most of that. Um, in general, I think the big questions we've been hearing from counties right now is um, when that program would be available, what people need to do now um, for the, actually tomorrow, um, there was a number of things that they needed to do for surface water, and uh, that looks at existing or anybody diverting from surface water specifically. So. People that had an existing riparian diversion that had already filed or an existing appropriative right or small irrigation right, they didn't need to do anything. But people that had diverted water last year, uh, last calendar year, needed to file a statement of diversion and use. This is just simple state law that they're required to do it, um, regardless if they're exercising a riparian or storage or diverting to storage and using storage, they still have to file a statement of diversion and use. Um, the other components that are a little trickier was notifying the state pretty much or that they're exempt from parts of the filing of the statement of diversion and use. Um, this is also in water code, but it's specific to springs that don't fall, flow off your property. And it also includes some adjudicated areas, which I don't, I'm not sure all the counties here, but a lot of those adjudicated areas are more in Central Valley and uh, Southern California and some groundwater ones. We did develop some forms for those that people could go out and fill out to notify us that that, that was the case. 
the last form that we had was, was folks that had not diverted last year, had not exercised the surface water right, but were planning to starting this year or moving forward getting their license, and we had a form for that as well. So I think that covers pretty much everything I had. Um, we'll have questions at the end, I assume. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, very much. Um, next, we have Scott Bauer with uh, California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Scott? Uh, this is a big site that's being developed for cultivation um, up in the hills, and I titled this, this particular presentation Regulatory Challenges. In Humboldt County, I work um, in the Emerald Triangle, which is Humboldt, Mendocino, and Trinity Counties. That's where I, we do all of our, our work, watershed enforcement team. Um, and so we have a lot of experience with, with this issue and with trying to regulate this issue. So, um, but real quick, a, a shameless plug for our team or give you some idea of what we do. Um, you know, our main job is to protect public trust resources, fish, wildlife, and the habitat they depend on. That's our, our main job. Um, but we're out there to enforce fish and game code. There, these three code sections are, are you know, this lake and stream alteration, pollution, and trash. And we have special authority now to fine cultivators civilly for when they, when they violate those laws. We don't have to go to a DA anymore. We just go through an administrative law judge and we issue fines and, and we've had some pretty big cases. I think uh, our biggest is about $300,000 now. Um, we also enforce uh, California Endangered Species Act, that kind of thing, when we're on these, these sites. Um, but we enforce all applicable state law. So we have cops, well, our game wardens are our officers, and they, uh, when we're on these sites, they're enforcing health and safety code, which some of you are. That's related to all of this, the cannabis cultivation. Um, and we work with the water board. Um, we'll be working with CDFA, um, all the other agencies that are involved, uh, local agencies with the county, we work really closely with. And um, we are permitting sites. We've permitted 500 cultivation sites in Humboldt, Trinity, and Mendocino counties. I think about the majority are, are really Humboldt County, but we're permitting sites. They come in, they get a permit, we're doing it, um, and, and they're, they're good to go as long as they're not violating other, other state laws. Um, and we have three teams. Uh, I'm on team two in Eureka here. We have a team in Reading, and we have a team in Napa, and we are expanding. Um, Governor just authorized us to essentially double. And so we're going to be broken in half, though, between enforcement and permitting. We'll have a permitting team who deals with legitimate sites, and then we'll have a team um, which deals with those that have no intention of ever coming into compliance, and we'll, we'll take care of those. Um, but, you know, we'll talk about the nat natural resource impacts a little bit, or, or as fast as I can. This is actually, if you look at this, is a stream channel that um, is originated at a grow site, and it's, this is called a debris torrent, and the whole channel basically is scoured down, took out the neighbor here, this is the neighbor, this is his road, and the site basically wiped out 3,000 feet of stream channel. So, we are seeing really significant impacts from some of these sites where we have massive lands, you know, landslides, uh, water diversion, and you'll see more of those as I, as I go along here. But the biggest issue, and, and Dan talked about this, you can't really see it very well, but there's a big tank here and there's about 18 different hoses going into this tank, feeding eight different grow sites, um, about 5,000 plants, and they, they dried up the whole stream. So like Dan said, we're concerned about keeping water in the streams for fish, right? We're spending millions to, to restore salmon and steelhead populations. We want to keep restoring them instead of losing them to a, a lot of water diversion. Um, the pollutants, yesterday I saw a 10,000 gallon diesel tank with no containment um, on the land, on the grow site, and it was 20 feet from a stream. So if you live out there and you're taking water down below this cultivation site in a diesel tank, you know, you have a, a residence out there and that 10,000 gallon diesel tank were to fail, your water supply would be destroyed, right? So we see a lot of diesel to power generators, 
power fans, lights, you name it. A lot of diesel fuel out there. This is all sediment. This is our, one of our biggest issues. People grade the land, they push the dirt off the mountain, and it ends up in our streams. It's not good for streams and for fish and wildlife. Um, insecticides, that'll be regulated um, as we go along here, but we still see some kind of nasty stuff being put onto the, to the bud. And obviously, you know, we're, that's a, a human health issue, um, but it also ends up in our streams, and so we don't want to see that. But really, the, the main issue out there are the fertilizers. Um, I think yesterday I saw five, 500 gallons of liquid fertilizer that's being put on the plant, on the, on the soil, and you know, it washes into streams and it causes bad things in streams, over fertilization of streams. So those are our main issues that we see. <laughs> this is actually a stream channel that they buried and built a road up um, to access a cultivation site. So we call it best management practices and protection of, of streams and riparian, that's the forest along the stream. We want to see those areas protected. Counties have ordinances against that uh, or against damaging those areas, and we see this more often than I really care to talk about, but people kind of not taking care of our streams and rivers. And then there's the bigger landscapes uh, level issue is this opening up of forest conversion of big areas of, of habitat, of forest lands. And in, in our area, there are thousands of these openings, and I'll, I'll show you more of that as we go along here. And just so real quickly, here's the species that kind of led to us really getting involved in, in doing enforcement and trying to push this, this issue out to the forefront of, of people's concerns and understanding are the coho salmon, the steelhead trout, chinook salmon. You know, the state has spent hundreds of millions of dollars to restore these species and they're being impacted by, by cultivation um, out, out across the landscape. So we've been trying to protect them. And then there's other critters that are out there, like these are little headwater amphibian species. They live up in the highest parts of the streams, and that's where a lot of water is taken. It's diverted from way up, and it's diverted down through a gravity-fed pipe to the grow site. And these guys are being affected, and this is a coastal cut for a trout. Um, we don't want to see those species listed, so we're trying to protect them before they end up like a, a cup of salmon. And then there's some ones that you've probably heard about, the fisher impacted by rodenticides. Rodenticides are mainly on trespass grows. That's stuff that's being grown out on um, public lands, or in some cases, a large private timberlands. Uh, spotted owl is impacted by rodenticide, and then there's things like bats. Bats are being affected by the lighting up of greenhouses, kind of a, not a newer thing, but becoming more common. Light the greenhouses up, and there's light pollution, there's noise pollution. So we're worried about these guys getting impacted as well. A lot of species being impacted by cultivation. So <laughs> I, I did a slideshow for uh, uh, forestry few months ago and I, I kind of have modeled this for you guys you, you know you, you have a different situation here but how how is this industry or this activity affect counties affect the state um, this has become a really big deal and this isn't really a, a natural resource issue as much as people as a people issue is the conflict when this guy sets up 20 greenhouses in the middle of the landscape and his access is through your property or through a private timberland, uh, a large timber company, there's always inevitably conflict. And we hear about it all the time. I get a phone call a day from you know, people shooting guns, scaring us, um, that kind of thing. So conflict is a real issue, and it affects us in a number of ways, and I'll, I'll explain more later. Um, like I said, this is a southern torrent salamander. It's a rare little uh, amphibian. Well, what happens if this guy starts to blink out because there's so many water diversions on the landscape? Another species gets listed. It means more regulations for everybody, not just for the industry, the cultivation or cannabis industry, but for the timber industry, you, know, you name it. We're all affected by that. And we don't want to have to deal with another listed species. So that's why we're trying to regulate in particular water use. We don't want to see new species listed and, and more regulations. 
You know, this is a, a really fascinating issue. This isn't, again, this isn't really, it is kind of a resource issue, but we hear about this all the time. Properties that were once $200,000 going for a million dollars. Um, a property for 400 acres recently sold for 3.7 million. If you're a timber company or you, you're uh, someone that owns timber lands and you want to expand, you want to expand your base, you're not going to be able to. In Humboldt County, the land values are, are, are astronomical now. And so it's hard, and I hear about it from uh, conservancies wanting to protect land, getting large chunks of land purchased out from underneath them for cash. So it affects land management, really, and which affects fish and wildlife as well. You know, it's hard to manage for, for, for critters that are, that are endangered or sensitive. They need big areas of habitat, intact habitat. And this is changing the face of, of the landscape. This is a picture of sudden oak death, which some, uh, some counties will understand. Um, the, the spread of invasive species seems to be occurring more rapidly. Roads that were once seasonal, used only in the summertime, are now used almost year round. And when they're wet, you track in things like a uh, sudden oak pathogen. Um, there's a whole host of, of invasive species that are showing up. Bullfrogs, people are building ponds, which, which we want. We want people to store water from winter, winter water use or winter water and use it in the summer. Well, that brings in bullfrogs, which impact all kinds of species, especially our native amphibians. So we're worried about that. How is that going to change regula the regulatory world? And it, it, it's a serious issue. This is a, a burn. This cultivation site caught fire because the neighbors hated each other and they lit their neighbor's place on fire and it led to a, 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 a fire that actually almost got under control, but wildfire, 90% of wildfires in the western United States are caused by humans. We put more and more people out on the rural, the rural interface, you know, um, and you're going to have more wildfire. That's not good for fish and wildlife, it's not good for cost to, to you know, control fire, it's going to happen more. It's just simply a matter, it's just a fact. So how do we prevent that from happening, right? And there's a lot of ways to do that through the regulatory process, but it's, it's a real issue. This is an AK-47 right here that we uh, found on the growth site. You know, for us, one of our jobs, our department and other departments are to um, monitor fish and wildlife populations. And it's hard to do that when you accidentally, when you're walking up a stream, a guy walks up with one of these, and, and we had biologists last year that were shot at when they were doing a survey. So there's conflict again. Um, and it's not only a safety issue for our staff, for our biologists, but for anybody that happens upon um, a site. People, um, you know, there are people out there growing that aren't very savory types, and so that's a, that's a significant issue. Um, and this is, I wish we could see this better, but there's been a rapid amount of change in the past couple of years. Um, Humboldt, Trinity, Mendocino, View, Calaveras, see things are changing, right? This is um, Post Mountain, Trinity County. Judy would know, <laughs> would know this site very well. Um, about nine square miles right here. This is uh, was once timber timber company property. It was subdivided years ago. Well, in 2012, so only five years ago, you can see these are all cultivation sites. They look like clear cuts uh, on the landscape. And what is this, four years later, it looks like this. You know, so that's rapid change. And that's, that impacts fish and wildlife, and it impacts our ability to recover species. It impacts, it's an incredible challenge for the regulatory agencies, for local agencies to try and deal with that. How do we bring those people in? Who's going to come in? Um, and so it affects us all. Uh, closer to home for us, this is also in Humboldt County. Um, you can see some greenhouses here on the landscape, some openings. This is all cultivation sites. And two years' time, you know, there's a lot more here. So in, in the past two or three years, we keep saying, those of us that have been involved and have been watching this and trying to regulate it, it's got to be the peak. The green rush has got to be peaking out here, and, and we're, we're wrong every year. You know, this year it's bigger, and, and hopefully 
we'll reach a plateau this year and, and we'll see some kind of change. But we're seeing a lot of landscape change. This is a Van Dusen River and there's nothing here. It's old timberlands and there's kind of an old cultivation site right here. Two years later, you know, uh, boom, there they are. Um, and this is in uh, Trinity County. So it's really hard for us to try to regulate that and, and protect public trust resources. Now I'm just going to show you some slides. I, I took some photos a couple weeks ago in an airplane, and this is a <laughs> this is about I think five acres. It was just cleared, and so the county of Humble has a process that's going on. We're, we're, we're getting people into the permit uh, program. We're permitting people in, in partnership with them, really. But this site, it, it doesn't have anything because I looked. Um, no permit but it's being prepared for a, a very large cultivation site. And same with this one, and in this case, these guys were working. There's four bulldozers, three bulldozers, and, and an excavator right here, and, and people are, are kind of going for it, you know? Um, the green rush is happening, so how, you know, it's a real challenge for us to try and just to bring this under control right now. And this one um, has a permit application, um, but, it's in the process, and the original site was this big, and we flew it two weeks ago, and it's a giant. This is a bulldozer sitting there. It looks like a little tinker toy, but massive amount of grading, and it's just happening all over the place. And it's troubling um, from a fish and wildlife protection perspective, but you know, how, do we, how do we manage that? Um, you know, what do we do with these people, right? What are we going to do with these people? Um, in the future here. Now, I, I threw this together, I, I've been pretty busy, but I, I threw together some thoughts um, of, of stuff we've been doing here locally um, in, in a regulatory process. And it's thoughts for all of you who may be going down, you know, traveling down the road to regulate within your local areas, within your jurisdictions, some considerations. You know, um, and it's worked closely with the state agencies, the Water Board, CDFA, Fish and Wildlife, and Humboldt County's been great. Um, you know, we talk all the time, we meet all the time, and we discuss the issues, you know, what things that come up all the time, how do we deal with this, and how do we deal with this person? So working together um, is the only way we're gonna to get this thing regulated uh, appropriately. And I say abundantly enforced rules, regs, and ordinances. Um, the only way to make this thing work is to enforce the rules we have. And our department is doing that um, pretty strongly. And it's important for counties to really think about enforcement. How can we enforce? Do you have enough people to enforce? And I say adequately staff enforcement, code enforcement have a lot of, and that's a challenge. It's a budgetary challenge, I understand that, but to get this thing under control, you gotta, you gotta conduct enforcement, otherwise people are gonna just grade five acres um, anytime they feel like it. And our county has just done this, have a heavy fine schedule. Um, it fines are a deterrent, and um, we see that within our own agency, our fines are, are leading to change. Leading to change across the landscape, I believe in, you've got to have a stick and a carrot. It can't all be the carrot, otherwise people will, will ignore you. Um, and I say this, don't rely on, on state agencies for doing all the enforcement. We can't enforce all the rules. You know, we have our set of rules that we're working with. Uh, we can't possibly do it all with the staff we have. So, um, you know, we're doing our best and we work in hand in hand with local law enforcement, but you can't rely on us um, for all the enforcement needs. Just some more. Training planning staff. It, I almost feel like I want to take all planning staff out in the field with us on a search warrant or on an inspection of a site and talk about the issues. Here are the issues for your area, for your county. You know, here's what you should be considering when we're permitting these sites, sometimes in the middle of nowhere. They need to be properly trained. Um, and conduct site visits, have staff go conduct site visits and look at the sites to make sure that they're telling the truth. Um, that's a big problem, actually, is that people um, aren't always telling the truth when they put in for a permit. Um, 
you know, we, we, we want to believe people. Um, unfortunately, I've seen way too many people come in with a, a permit application that isn't truthful. They, they didn't have as much acreage as they said they did, and now they're claiming they had four times what they said they did. So it's a trust issue. We've got to build trust, and we've got to make, keep people you know, honest um, when they're trying to get permitted. Now we have a process in Humboldt County, it's called Remediation Restoration Retirement? Retirement Remediation Relocate. Okay, Relocate. And um, I say proceed with caution because some of the sites out there, you know, there, there's ability to remediate, sometimes there's not. So if you do something like that, we want to see people be brought down to where, you know, flat land, or they're not up on steep slopes. We want that to happen. It, it needs to happen. It's better for, for resources, for, for natural resources. Just make sure that there's a really clear process and it's a good tool, actually, is to try and use that. Get people out of the hills and to, to places that are, are more conducive to farming, right? Um, and I also feel that there's a lot of people we have had interaction with, <laughs> interactions with where they've broken the law, they've done a lot of environmental damage, just not sure um, they should be part of the, of the system in, in, in a lot of cases, especially those that never responded to us. They hit out after we, we, they, when we sent them issues, on, we violated their property with uh, fish and game code violations, never heard from them, and now they're trying to get a permit. I feel like they still need to talk to us and address those issues before they go down this other path. So just one of those things to think about. Um, you know, I know a lot of counties have ordinances, stream buffers, that kind of thing. Make sure you have, our county does, which is great, buffer the streams and wetlands and so you don't have to deal with, um, uh, you know, having resource impacts. And we're trying to protect resources and we don't want to see those habitats, those sensitive habitats impacted. Then in a nuisance, you know, um, we've talked a lot about this, where, where the site grows, you know, and I hear from people all the time, you know, oh, the smell's bad, and oh, you know, can't you do something? It's like, no, um, that's a different issue. That's not a fish and wildlife issue, but it's really important to think about where sites are going to go in the future. Otherwise, you're going to be faced with really uh, upset people when you know uh, uh, there's one acre of grow behind their behind their house. Just it happens. It's real, and it's something to think about. And I say this because we have this our, as our own problem aerial imagery. If you're going to base how you're regulating off of you know looking down and seeing what they have there, spend the money and get good imagery. There's services out there, there's Digital Globe, there's other things, but don't rely on Google because it's too spotty, the imagery's old. Find some good imagery so that you can, it'll, it'll help you regulate your, your this activity a lot better. And I think lastly, um, this is something we're struggling with. How many grow sites can be in a watershed before there's no water left for fish and wildlife? or they've just cut a ton of forest down. What is the carrying capacity? John and I, John Ford and I talked about what, how do we figure that out? And the water board and us, we all need to kind of figure this out. It's 500 grow sites in a small watershed, too many to sustain fish and the industry. I don't know how we do that, but we need to figure that out. And it's something to think about. At some point, you're gonna to have to draw a line and say, no, that, that area has enough. If you're a rural county and you have, you know, natural resources, you got to think about that, and, and we still need to. I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you, Scott, very much. Um, I think you did a good job of kind of giving information to board of supervisors members that they would want to consider uh, when developing local programs or regulations around cannabis, and so. Um, I would like to offer uh, Lindsay and Dan the same opportunity to maybe share with you comments at this point in the process for them, what they've learned and what you might find informative to you as you think about this going forward.
while I'm thinking about that, I forgot to mention that our timeline. Um, I'm going to get to that, but uh, the timeline for the uh, draft policy and the and the uh, draft uh, waste discharge requirements or general order statewide is hopefully around the end of next week or the week after, and we'll have a 60-day public comment period. Plan to bring it to the board in uh, in mid October for adoption. So, looking at this, as far as guidance goes. Um, you know, a lot of what we've learned has come from the inspections that the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the State Water Board has gone out on and the impacts that we're seeing out there. We're trying to address as many as, as we can at the state level, but there are a number of things that, uh, both from a legislative direction, you know, that, that we cannot uh, address. And many of those were the ones that um, Scott was touching on, such as the the more localized impacts, you know, we're coming out from something that, that addresses this at a statewide perspective. And the anticipation is that the local counties, when they develop their local ordinances and, and additional restrictions, will look a little bit more closely at what's going on in their region to make sure that they're addressing the environmental impacts at that scale. Um, in general, there's a number of things under the um, impacts on the Environmental Quality Act, California Environmental Quality Act, that we're not addressing. Um, I don't know so much as the CDFA is addressing them directly because, you know, again, we're statewide programmatic type programs um, that should be looked at more closely. Um, you know, things like aesthetics, lighting, sound, uh, transportation, all of those types of things will not be, I don't think, significantly addressed at the state level. So those types of things are really, you know, some key things to focus in on. And I would just like to echo that it's kind of um, a different perspective that we have at the statewide level and cultivation throughout the state is so diverse and I heard today that even within a county um, there's a lot of diversity between how people grow, what neighborhoods want, um, and it's been interesting to learn but I think it will be an issue moving forward. Our regulations, our proposed regulations, um, were vague in a lot of areas because we don't know how to address indoor versus outdoor versus mixed light. There's a lot of, I mean, really those things should all be looked at individually. They're very different ways of cultivation. So how do you define something like canopy for indoor that's the same as for outdoor? Um, so I think as you're moving forward, looking at um, how different the industry is um, just in your area might be useful. And our draft EIR, uh, we're not addressing uh, site development, um, which I know is a, a large part of the environmental degradation, but we are, um, we did a little bit in the cumulative impacts. You might want to take a look at our draft EIR for that. Um, so uh, one other thing I didn't mention, and, and I, I meant to, and so I want to come back to it, is I just want to, to say how much members of the industry have been uh, helpful in my office and working with us to educate us. You know, growing up here in Humboldt County, uh, cannabis has been a part of the culture, and if you will, the subculture, my entire adult life. And yet, cannabis cultivation as it exists now was very, very different from when it was 30 years ago. And so the members of the industry that we've had the opportunity to work with have really been fantastic in educating us, and they want to work with us, they want to collaborate with us so that we develop rules that not only work for them but also meet our goals and the things that we're responsible for in the services that we provide uh, to the communities that, that we serve. So um, would be glad to answer any questions that any of you have. Dan, I've got a question. You mentioned uh, tomorrow's deadline for filing some paperwork. What has the agency done to get the word out to the cultivator that there are deadlines? We sent out a, um, a, well, use the microphone. I should start back in um, October, we, we went throughout the state and presented on things that people needed to do, and this was one of the things that we presented on. Um, once we had the forms up and ready, uh, we always encourage people from the state level to sign up for our email subscription list That's and to visit our websites. That's our primary way of getting the information out to folks. 
Um, so we sent out the, once the forms are ready, we sent out the email to everybody, letting them know that the forms were up. Uh, we've done numerous presentations up here in Santa Rosa area, you know, all over as far as letting people know. Um, I heard it on KMUD on the way up to sport yesterday. So we've, we've done what we can to let people know. And we also blasted the Water Board's forms message when it was available through our email listserv, um, just to get the word out a little bit more. In addition to what you're talking about in terms of reporting by July 1st, I, I, if I recall correctly, this is related to those who are filing every year their water usage, correct? And now on the, on the uh, reporting online, there's a new segment if you're a cannabis cultivator, click here, and that's the July 1st deadline, if I recall. Is that correct? So the way the uh, legislative code was written is that the idea is to bring all the existing cultivators up to up to you know their their require what they're required to do by July 1st. That, so, that was pretty much what the main standard was. So people that were already there are already were already complying. So the people that weren't complying yet, it was to get them in compliance with state laws. And then we had another group of folks that there's an uh, exemption there for a suite of people with the springs and with in adjudicated areas. Um, those folks we wanted to, the, the code said that they had to provide us with documentation that, that they were, that they fell under that category. For those who weren't cultivating last year and maybe aren't aware of this deadline and now it's like tomorrow for them what are you going to do with them there it's it's a timeline issue so the way that everything was set up was to bring the existing cultivating community into okay. the regulatory fold and through the licensing program first okay um, people that are don't meet the deadline uh, what i briefly read this morning and when the recent senate bill that combined it is that they would be having to wait until next year to get their license. Okay, and then um, you might have touched upon this in your, your talk. Um, is there a threshold for those on the personal growth side? Threshold in which in way? In terms of square footage or I think you... you so know. on the personal growth side, it looks at a thousand square feet of disturbance. If you're a personal grow and you're disturbing more than a thousand square feet, then you're gonna need to enroll. Um, we kind of did that as, you know, if your county is 100 square feet of canopy and you disturb 1,000 square feet to put that in, we probably need to address that site. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This question is for Lindsay. Lindsay, I believe you had mentioned uh, track and trace, and of course I think we're probably all anxious as to what, where, where is the state in the process and you said 2018, can you get any closer to when a contract would be awarded? Very soon. So we are in the final stage of our procurement process. Um, I believe it's called Stage Gate 4. They have a fancy name for it. Uh, we will have a vendor on board very soon and our deadline is still to have it up and running by 2018. So, okay, any time in 2018. So January 1. 2018. <laughs> to get a track and trace program for the state up and running January of 2018. That's what we're going to do. Thank you very much. Let's give this panel a huge uh, round of applause and thank you for the great work that they've done.